Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. Tonight in our first story, we'll take you down to beautiful Henry's Fork of the Snake River. It was named for Andrew Henry of the Missouri Fur Company, who established a fort on the river's bank in 1810. It's a magnificent stretch of river tucked into the southeast corner of Idaho with roots reaching back to the very edges of the Continental Divide. The sources of the Henry's Fork are as spectacular as the river itself. This is the appropriately named Falls River. It begins in Yellowstone National Park, then heads to the west, spilling over cave falls on its frantic journey to join the larger river. In the soft morning light, the spray from the cascading water explodes in a mist of sunshine. The long years of drought have been banished by a wall of water. Further to the north, another source of the Henry's Fork gushes down the side of a mountain into a pool surrounded by lush green. Warm River is fed almost entirely by springs and flows so quickly it seldom freezes. Some say Big Springs is the real source of the Henry's Fork. The water is clean and clear, pooling up from the ground and becoming a river within a hundred feet of its source. Perfect habitat for trout, it pushes towards the Henry's Fork bringing the big ones that have made the river known worldwide as a mecca of fly fishing. Big Springs merges with water from Henry's Lake to pour into Island Park Reservoir. Below the dam, the tailwaters flow into Box Canyon, already peopled with a number of serious fishermen on this weekday morning. The river meets a virtual gauntlet of ardent anglers as the Henry's Fork works its way through the old railroad ranch at Harriman State Park. But the most dramatic stretch of this beautiful river is the section that rushes over spectacular upper and lower Mesa Falls, a fitting finale in this year of big water. Whatever, if you want to just hang on so it gives you your balance, that's all you need to do. Okay, but you know what? Just below Mesa Falls is a steep, rocky trail that leads down to the river's edge. Local ranchers Brian Loosely and Brad Rhodes breezily inform us that they have been launching fishing boats from the bank below since they were boys. Our trepidation turns to astonishment as they begin to propel the aluminum boats down the vertical trail. It is not designed for the timid, or for Teva sandals for that matter, but our rather ungraceful descent reflects our inexperience at dragging drift boats down impossible inclines. Now they can just hop in from here, can't they? Just slide on in. The two powerful cowboys, dressed appropriately in solid boots, handled the aluminum boats like they were reluctant heifers on their way to the barn. We tag along, feeling, well, like tag-alongs, determined to do our part in this strenuous caper. Wayne has a little bit of sweat going. Wayne definitely has quite a bit of sweat going. We reach the trail's end and yank the sturdy boat over the final lip. Is this required of everyone who launches a fishing trip down the Henry's Fork? Brian answers our question in characteristic fashion with a modest understatement. No, that's not common. Not very many people do this. <laughs> it's a difficult trail to get down, so it's pretty hard for them yeah. to come down. Yep, came up after. The reward is a float through some of the most incredible scenery in Idaho, right and it doesn't pale with repetition. Brad has been boating this stretch for 15 years, and it still has the power to move him. You don't get any prettier place than this, though. I've been to Alaska a bunch of times, and this spring especially, as green as it is, this is gorgeous. It's gorgeous. That's right over towards the bank there. On your follow-through, come forward just a little farther. There you go. It's my first time fishing from a drift boat, and I'm taking every advantage of Brian's years of experience. I, you get more fishing in, I think, uh, by far. You get to you get a great oarsman like Brian, and you get to hang around the, the holes a little bit longer. Back up, take another run at him. Got him. Good. Nice little rainbow one. This is a wild fishery. They don't plant any of the river here. And so uh, some of the fish, we're just starting to get some, they've got some new regulations here and trying to help the river out, try to get some larger fish here. So I think if uh, in a few years, hopefully those little guys are going to get a little larger and we're going to see some more larger fish in this fishery. Little guy. 
Take it easy. Let's get you another ride in here, should we, Wayne? Yeah, let's go for some size this time. Uh, I lost it there. You know, I, I lose it sometimes with that foam out. There. Brian learned to fish from his father, Lynn, an avid angler who joined our expedition later in the day. Their love of the outdoors is a heritage that stretches back several generations to 1891 when Lynn's great-grandfather traveled up from Utah to establish a homestead near the waters of the Henry's Fork. Just, oh, I missed one. Hey, really, that was a good strike. With fly fishing, you have to analyze your river and uh, put the fly in the most natural presentation that you can to the fish or they won't even uh, bite at it. And so it takes a little more concentration, but sometimes that's good. Then you forget your other worries and you're just thinking about fishing and uh, yeah, gosh, it's more relaxful. I've been skunked a lot of times fishing, but just being out in the, in the open and on the river and the peace and quiet, it's uh, a very relaxful sport. Well, we should get a strike there, shouldn't we, son? Father and son float slowly down the river, in and out of the golden light, passing through evening shadows where the big ones lurk. These are the times that trigger memories, recollections of lazy summer days gone by. I remember the first fish I caught that was above five pounds. And, oh, was I excited? We even had a flat tire and had to walk out. And I told my father, we can walk out, but I'm taking that fish with me. I don't want to leave it there for somebody to steal. There will be no big fish this evening, but if you were to ask father and son about this quiet float on the Henry's Fork, they would agree it was time well spent. Perhaps conservationist Aldo Leopold said it best when he wrote, what was big was not the trout, but the chance. What was full was not my creel, but my memory. Uh, first step in preparing kokanee is uh, to scale the fish there, because we're going to cook them with the skins on, so we want to scale them, and they, they scale very easily. In fact, Some Idaho anglers prefer catch and release fishing on wild rivers like the Henry's Fork. But if you're in the mood to catch a mess of fish for dinner, try one of our state's many lakes or reservoirs you'll find summer stocked with a landlocked salmon called kokanee, the key to a delicious dinner if you follow the lead of gourmet cook Tracy Trent. Well, it's summertime in Idaho, and that means two things, fishing and gardening, big time pastimes in Idaho. And so today, we're going to prepare some kokanee salmon and use some fresh garden uh, herbs and vegetables and uh, create uh, poached salmon and basil pesto with pasta. Your typical catch will be a 10 to 14 inch fish. Generous limits provide ample opportunity for a summer full of tasty meals. Uh, first step in preparing kokanee is uh, to scale the fish there, because we're gonna cook them with the skins on, so we wanna scale them, and they, they scale very easily. In fact, Gracie uses a simple plastic scrubber and rubs against the scales. It removes them without damaging the skin. Inside is bright pink flesh, very similar to an ocean-going salmon. The first thing we're going to do is prepare the uh, water or liquid that we're going to poach the fish in. We've got 3 quarters of a cup of dry white wine. We're going to add some rosemary. We're using fresh rosemary because it's summertime and we've got it. And some lemon basil, a little tarragon, and some thyme, and uh, a couple of slices of lemon, and some celery leaves chopped up fine. Now we're gonna take and put that on the stove. While the poaching liquid is heating, Tracy lines a pan with heavy duty aluminum foil and lays in the four fish. This recipe can also be done in the field over charcoal fires, but be careful to check that your coals aren't too hot. Things you gotta remember about cooking fish is the worst thing you can do to them is to overcook them. You overcook fish, particularly uh, salmon, uh, and it, uh, it gets dry and the texture isn't good and it start, begins to lose flavor. So we didn't let it boil. He pours the poaching liquid over the fish, folds up the foil, and places the pan in the oven at 375 degrees. While the fish begins to cook, Tracy takes us through the steps of creating a delicious basil pesto. And you start out 
with uh, fresh basil leaves, just the leaves. Uh, separate the stems out, no flowers. Use only green basil, uh, not the purple kind. And we're going to put in a couple of cups of tightly packed basil leaves. That's how you measure it. Pack it in there. And then a half a cup of extra virgin olive oil. Three tablespoons of pine nuts. And three cloves of garlic. I kind of subscribe to the uh, you never can use too much garlic method, but uh, or philosophy, but. And then, liquefy it. Afterwards, Gracie adds a half cup of Parmesan cheese and three tablespoons of butter to the mixture, blends it again, and then sets it aside because it's time to check on our fish. We'll check our fish. And I can see they need just a titch longer. Uh, the meat was just starting to flake at the edge. And as I pushed the fork down into the fish towards the backbone, I could see it wasn't separating easily. What you want when you're cooking salmon, you want it to be just done. You don't want it to be look raw, but it, if it gets to the point where it's flaky all the way to the backbone, you've really almost cooked it too long. Back it goes into the oven for at least another five minutes. Now, pay close attention to this butter, next part, but, because uh, Tracy is about to reveal the recipe the of the most so savory I'm salmon sauce of... our incredible Idaho crew has ever tasted. So a quarter pound of butter, a couple of tablespoons each of Dijon mustard and ketchup. We've got four tablespoons of soy sauce and one tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce, a teaspoon of lemon juice, and then at least two cloves of garlic uh, that you crush through a press. And, or you can use more. Now, I believe you ought to use more, and so we're going to use four. And of course, a clove of garlic doesn't come in a standard size, so I picked four big cloves because I think this really, uh, this sauce is very good, and the, and the garlic is what makes the sauce. So I use lots. Now we're going to put this on the stove and heat it, but we don't, do not want to boil it. We don't want to cook it. We want to melt the butter and blend the ingredients. At this point, Tracy begins cooking the fresh lemon pepper pasta that he'll toss with the basil pesto. The sign of a great chef is one who can prepare a meal and have everything cooked and ready to serve at once. And then immediately, Add our pesto. Appropriate amount, which is about that much. And toss. And Tracy has brought it off. The fish is done to perfection. The bones are removed easily by carefully pulling the flesh away with the fork. He adds a side of basil pesto and pasta, a mound of tossed green salad, a slice of an Italian bread called ciabatti, and the magic touch, the secret salmon sauce. Bon appetit. I think it might be it's either silver-haired or a hoary. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a hoary. Yeah. These guys got some jaws on them. You know, there's a creature in Idaho with a sonar system so sophisticated that with all of man's advanced technology, it cannot be duplicated. This also makes it a very difficult animal to study because it easily avoids man's attempts to capture it. But patience and perseverance pay off, and in our next story, we're going to get a close-up look at this mysterious creature of the night, the bat. They don't make it easy. The trail into the capture site is rough, steep, and rocky. It's an intriguing rimrock area near Bliss called the Bennett Hills, part of the Bureau of Land Management's Shoshone District. The scientists know of a number of caves in the area, and they suspect that there are more here yet to be discovered. There's also reason to believe that bats will roost in the narrow crevices 
high up in the rim rock that frames the valley. Let's put it out. As is the case the with most biologists, first. they have learned to adapt their schedules to fit the lifestyle of the animals they study. Yeah. So this excursion begins yeah. in the soft golden light of early way. evening. A harp trap. When you get it set up, it looks something like a harp. The, the strings in the harp are actually monofilament line. They all run vertically and it's designed to confuse the echolocation systems on bats. Lyle Lewis is part of a research team made up of scientists from the Bureau of Land Management, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and the United States Forest Service. Recent surveys show that in the last five or six years, the population of bats in the area has declined by almost two-thirds. This reflects a trend nationwide. Go, Six go, go, bat go, go. species in the United States okay, have been listed as endangered, and 18 others are candidates for listing. Six of those candidates are species that reside in Idaho. And we know very little about them, so it's difficult to protect them without uh, doing some survey work, trying to find out where they uh, are feeding, where they're roosting, and uh, where they're getting water where they have their, uh, what's called maternity roost, where they have their babies, as well as uh, where the males and the uh, non-pregnant females hang out. And the more we learn about bats, the more we're finding just how beneficial they really are and how important they are to making the whole system function. But in this area, just being a predator of nighttime insects is a, a really big benefit. Uh, obviously, the more bats, the less insect spraying we have to do. Uh, it's important for farmers. A single bat can eat up to 600 insects in an hour, signifying an exceptionally effective predator. The sun has disappeared behind a far bluff, leaving behind a world suddenly bereft of its golden warmth. Up in the cloudless sky is the faint outline of the moon. It gradually becomes more distinct, brightening as the shadows deepen. The first bats appear flying erratically, silhouetted against the fading light. The scientists hurry to finish their tasks in the near darkness. The wind seems to have ruled in our favor, calming in the cooler night air. A hopeful indicator of success. Now it becomes a waiting game. Ready, bring on the bats. As we wait, Lyle explains what scientists expect are the reasons for declining bat populations. One of the biggest ones is uh, people not realizing when they go into caves in the wintertime that they're, they, they're disturbing bats. To combat this problem, land managers have built gates across some caves and abandoned mines. These will keep people out, but allow the bats to pass through to their wintering area, which is called a hibernaculum. They actually go into a, a much deeper hibernation state than even bears do. They, they shut their body temperature down to 32 degrees or just barely above that and go into what's called torpor. And, and really, uh, the respiration is just very, very slight. When the bats are disturbed during this hibernation, they expend energy, moving away from the source of disturbance. If this happens fairly often, they will literally starve to death, using up all the fat reserves required to get them through the winter. If a gate like this is installed, the bats have a better chance of surviving until spring. Oh, we got one. All right. It's hanging upside down, tangled in one of the mist nets. It's a male ori bat, distinguishable by his large size and the frosted look to his air. Hey, could you give me your leather glove? These guys got some jaws on them. When you handle bats like I do, we get rabies shots to make sure that, uh, you, you know, you have, to do, you have to take some precautions because when you're actually handling them and you know you will be, uh, they're going to be trying to bite you and occasionally they may. Although rabies is often linked with bats, in reality, less than 4% of them actually carry the disease. Let's take him back over here where we can do all the measurements. 
Since a bat's weight can vary up to 20% in one night, the length of the bat's forearm has become the standardized measurement. In addition, the scientists record the time of capture, the bat's sex, and its age. That is, whether it's a full adult or not. All those are his fingers. It's a delicate, translucent membrane that connects the bat's fingers and thumb. His face is a study in concentration. He stares back at the camera steadily, no doubt seeing a reflection of himself in the camera lens, perhaps wondering about that mirror image. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. The time has come to set this mysterious creature free. He hesitates briefly and then disappears into the protective darkness. Thanks for joining us. As we close our show tonight, we'll take you back to the headwaters of the Henry's Fork of the Snake River. <laughs>